we're going to talk about clusters of galaxies or galaxy clusters. We have broken down clusters into two types. We refer to two types of clusters. The first are the rich clusters. Tom Fleming knows how to reach his students. He frequently interrupts to find out whether they're following what he's saying. Genevieve, would you like to venture a guess what we call the other class of clusters? Poor. Poor, very good. I can sit here and rant and rave and complain that, oh, our standards are low and that students don't learn in high school what they used to. But the fact of the matter is I have 135 students there now and I can't go back and change history uh, as to what sort of high school education they received. They're here, they're paying their tuition money. As I tell them on the first day of class, I'm gonna give you your money's worth. Look at the two galaxies on the animation in the left. Notice that the least massive galaxy, first of all, isn't as bright. The students in my class are fine arts majors, English majors, journalism, business. They're taking this because they're told you should have nine units of science to be a well-rounded person. So these are people that aren't going to become scientists. So I feel that I need to meet them halfway. He does that by giving them radio responders. That allows him to get immediate feedback. So what I'd like to do now is let's go to a question. And don't worry, I'll post this on the website after class. Which of the following is least easily explainable as a result of collision between galaxies? Has everyone answered? Interesting. Half of you think it's number four. Some galaxies seem to be undergoing bursts of star formation. But not everyone agrees. So here's what I want you to do. Start talking about it. If you think you know the right answer, convince your classmate that you've so got what, the right answer. Okay, what is that? So if two galaxies smash into each other, that's something pretty big. That's number three. Number three? That's three. The goal in my class is for them to learn how to solve problems. You know, there's some people saying, oh, well, you're just, you know, um, putting a happy face on the class, making it uh, a circus or something that's fun. Well, you know, I do subscribe to the Mary Poppins principle. A spoonful of sugar does help the medicine go down. But don't for a minute think that I have lowered the standards of my class or that I am not getting the students to think critically. Are we ready to try again? Let's see how many people changed their mind. And this time, the correct answer will be highlighted in red. I changed mine at the last second. That's sweet. <laughs> at least more of you got to the right answer. Let me just give you a brief explanation. Here's a person who has figured out how to marshal not only the technological resources, but the teaching resources to transform a sleepy, potentially sleepy, disengaged, uninterested group of students into an active, almost an active seminar that you wouldn't think could occur with more than 15 or 20. Here's another two galaxies that collided millions of years ago. And you can see that this looks a lot like our models. There's those little tails. What is so encouraging is it's not like Oz. It's not done behind the curtain. It's not done with smoke and mirrors. You can see what he's doing and you look at it and you say, I could do that. In fact, Tom Fleming learned to do that. When he began teaching in 1996, his classes looked very different. I just lectured and they sat passively by and took notes and then I gave them exams and I assigned homework and I'd have office hours where they could come in and ask questions about the homework. Were you trained as a teacher? No, not at all, not at all. I was trained as a research scientist. All of my colleagues in the astronomy department are trained that way. Tom Fleming learned how to teach here. He got a week of teacher training and a free laptop computer. All right, so did you get a chance to talk with each other about this particular scenario? So what did you come up with? It what gave me a chance to meet instructors from the fine arts college, from humanities, from social science. And when I started to learn about some of the techniques they used and how I could use my laptop, to implement some of those, I decided to experiment with it. And of course, I, I'm, I'm a scientist and I'm a guy. I like toys. I like to play with technology. And uh, so for me, it was fun to, to try new gadgets in class. And I found that I was getting a greater response from the students. Two-thirds of Fleming's students report they study at least two hours a night. 
What's some of your observations and what do you all think? According to the university, nearly 35% of the faculty have come to the teaching center this year, either for advice or training, but participation is voluntary. I have faculty call and or privately share with me, it's tough and I would really like to do or come to your workshop, but I don't have time, I can't, and I'm in the middle of a research project I've got to do. And some faculty have even shared with me, they'll say, now you know, Kathleen, that's not where the rewards are. Stars. Even though the University of Arizona paid for Tom Fleming's training and now pays him to teach other professors his techniques, he is not being considered for the ultimate reward, a lifetime job. In higher education, that's called tenure. Are you on the tenure track? No, I'm not. I am specifically paid to do this job by my department. Would you like to be on a tenure track? If you had asked me that question five years ago, I'd say yes. But as I see how things have evolved here for myself personally, I think I would say actually no. For me, the bottom line is the students. I, I seriously want them to have the best educational experience that is possible.